Hi, this is Brian Venton again with another My Town Media presentation. Today is an opinion piece on the voice referendum, and I've called it a voice of reason. I'm singularly surprised in what I perceive as a lack of discernment from religious leadership. For example, the Uniting Church of Australia, of which I'm a member, supports a yes vote. They say the upcoming referendum offers a significant chance for Australians to recognise and honour the First Nations people and advance as a unified nation. Members of the Uniting Church can actively participate in what they call the Together Yes campaign for First Nations by becoming a conversation host. The President of the UCA, Reverend Sharon Hollis, encourages members to consider hosting these conversations. But listen to what she says next underscoring the church's dedication to justice for First Nations people. Now, that's a loaded statement. Why do I disagree with this position? Well, I want to flesh out two reasons today. First, I think there is a problem when we make this an issue of justice, when in reality it should be about sovereignty. There are roughly three positions of sovereignty within our current national discourse. There are those, including many Aboriginals, who from a sovereign perspective don't see any need for change. The 1901 Constitution is a workable document and has served and continues to serve all Australians reasonably well. Within this group, there are also many who believe there's a subset agenda embedded in the yes vote, and they simply don't believe the Prime Minister when he says it's just a modest change. Then you have those within the Aboriginal movement, and it's a very mod, that describe themselves as sovereign originals. They argue that they have never ceded their sovereignty and believe they have a an inherent historical sovereign right, first in time, first in right, to nationhood. And this predates the 1901 Constitution, and their view of sovereignty needs to be honoured. Generally, they are opposed to the voice, and yet it's a bit confusing, for they also seem to have a, an agenda embedded within their own sovereign position. Then you have proponents of the voice themselves who clearly want sweeping change with reparations, inevitably a core motivator of our treaty. Now, my concern is that no one really wants to talk about sovereignty. And I would argue that sovereignty is not about land mass or having a continuing bona fide connection to land or, or being first in time, first in right, but it is something that is derived from our creator, not from our culture. Let me explain what I mean. I recently had purpose to visit a large Aboriginal community and the purpose of the visit was to provide support to local Aboriginal pastors in their Christian activities. And during the evening, one of the Aboriginal leaders gave what I thought was to be a welcome to country, but I soon noticed she was saying something very different. She called it an acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus, but the nuanced meaning didn't pass me by. In fact, there was nothing subtle about what she said. It was, it was like a modern-day creed. She says this, Today I acknowledge the Lordship and the Godhead of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We acknowledge you, Jesus, as the owner and possessor of all things, including the land that we are meeting on today, in accordance with your word from Psalm 24, which says, The earth is Yahweh's, and the fullness thereof, and the world and all those who dwell therein. Now remember, this is an Aboriginal uh, leader saying this. We acknowledge that the nations are your inheritance, she says and that the ends of the earth are the possession of Jesus, the Son of God, according to your word in Psalm 2. We acknowledge that the name of Jesus is the name above every name of those in heaven and on earth and those beneath the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We acknowledge you, Jesus, as the only way to know the Father, the one who is truth himself and the one who is eternal life. No one compares to you. Then she said this, we acknowledge you as the great I am, the Lord of the harvest, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the blessed and only potentate and sovereign. And we thank you for this most awesome opportunity and privilege to meet together on this land in your name, where you are present in the midst of us. Amen. Now, I don't know about what you would have done had you heard that at the time, but I thank the lady for what she said. In many respects, I suggest her statement stands in stark contrast to the lack of spiritual awareness of many in religious leadership today, where instead of faith informing our response to culture, our culture instead has been allowed to inform the content of our faith, where theological and cultural appeasement seems more important than adherence to biblical truth itself. I suggest sovereignty has little to do with where or when we were born, nor the colour of our skin, 
but is defined in terms of our relationship to God as our only sovereign. Now, this makes me no better than you, or you no better than me, because our identity, our worth, our value, and even our very existence is defined by our maker and not by our, by our cultural circumstance. I suggest this idea was not lost by our founding fathers back in 1897 when they were drafting our national constitution. Many of us would not be aware of this, but the initial draft to the preamble made no mention of God. However, many petitions were received asking that there should be some recognition of God in our constitution. So the words invoking divine providence were included. Now, the organising convention at the time questioned the appropriateness of introducing any religious formula into the constitution, and the amendment was voted down 17 to 11. However, during the subsequent statutory adjournment period, all the legislative chambers in Australia, except Queensland, suggested the insertion of some recognition of a divine being. The legislatures of New South Wales and South Australia and Western Australia suggested the words acknowledging Almighty God as the supreme ruler of the universe. Victoria suggested in reliance upon the blessing of Almighty God. Tasmania suggested duly acknowledging Almighty God as the supreme ruler of the universe and the source of all true government. Numerous petitions were received in a similar vein. So at the Melbourne Convention, a proposal to insert the words humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God was formally agreed to and subsequently inserted in the preamble of our 1901 Constitution. Now let me say this. It should not be lost to any of us, the transcendent meaning of these words. And I think our Aboriginal sister rightly nailed the issue, fair and square. The implication being that when we surrender ourselves to the divine view that God is our only sovereign, then we effectively lay aside our individual claims to personal or cultural sovereignty. That's what I call benevolent governance, not justice. Sadly, many of us, including some of our Christian leaders, are unwilling to embrace this view of sovereignty because it doesn't fit with a justice agenda. Now, my second reason argument against the voice has to do with the nature of reconciliation. Stephen Shadura, who is a senior lecturer in history at Campion College in Sydney, recently wrote an excellent critique of the Anglican minister, Reverend Michael Jensen's attempt to defend the voice to Parliament as a pathway to recognition. And at one point in his excellent rebuttal, Shavira says, perhaps a more important question is whether there can be reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians without there being Indigenous forgiveness. He said, it is very hard to see how there could be reconciliation in any Christian sense without forgiveness. And yet it is extremely rare to hear any prominent Indigenous Australian or representative body even utter the word forgiveness. Now, I think Shavira makes a very good point, and I agree with him. Saying sorry means nothing if there is no willingness to forgive. Religious leaders, like within the UCA, by taking a justice stance, show that they are both unwilling and logically unable to prosecute this argument, even though it is a core theological belief. Now, I remember at the turn of the century in John Howard's day when he was PM, when the sorry debate was raging in the nation. And I think Howard missed a profound moment in history to move the country to a place of genuine reconciliation. Instead, he argued, I was not in favour of an apology for a couple of reasons. The first one was that the idea of one generation apologising for the acts of another is an empty gesture, he said. If you apologise for your own behaviour, that has meaning. But I think it's a very empty thing for one generation to say, well, we apologise for something that was done by other people. That's meaningless. I thought his position at the time was very arrogant and lacked compassion as our representative head of the nation. It was a lost opportunity. Then later, when the 2001 cabinet records were revealed, they showed there was also a clearly expressed opposition to the idea of treaty at the time. And I suspect, and this is my opinion, that Howard felt that saying sorry would be in some sense an acknowledgement of culpability and would potentially feed treaty reparations. But note this, 
On the other hand, I suggest that the perpetually aggrieved within the Aboriginal sector also realised that if they accepted the apology and were willing to forgive as representative leaders of the Aboriginal community, then they would potentially nullify or neuter their demands for reparation. At the time, neither party were prepared to give an inch in order to become a reconciled nation. So now, 20 years later, the perpetually aggrieved are hoping to finally have their way. The real issue in my mind is an issue of the heart, but not of the Uluru from the heart kind of heart. Let me explain. Back in the 1990s, I got to meet the noteworthy Aboriginal bush pastor, Ronnie Williams, who, who died in 2003, and the newspapers at the time reported on his funeral, saying this, about 800 people packed the Great Hall of Parliament House, Canberra, to say goodbye to one of the best known and respected Aboriginal leaders in Australia. The tributes and the eulogies delivered spoke of his winsome smile, his gentle disposition, his disarming personality, and his ability to touch the lives of all, from diplomats to drunks, junkies to jet setters, abused women, prisoners, and those who had lost hope. Above all, they acknowledged his unswerving Christian faith. And I remember Ronnie describing to me personally his early life as, a, as an angry drunk, full of hatred and hopelessness. And he, he told me that when he found God and experienced the forgiveness God offers, then forgiveness started to flow from his own heart and turned his life around in a dramatic way. Then in 1999, I was scripting a song that I called We Long to Be Forgiven, and I wrote it as a response to our social and political circumstance at the time. And I rang up Ronnie for some inputs, and I included many of his ideas in the song. Now, the first couple of the verses in the chorus go like this. I've got a mate called Ronnie, a near full blood from out west, who told me of some stories of the things that we have done. The unrecorded history is easy to ignore. Well, I think we should say sorry and let the wounds begin to heal. He told me about a blackie from out Magumba way. The cops forgot to check on him as in a boob he lay. And when they opened up the cell to check on him, him again, there he was, a skeleton, still tied to ball and chain. The chorus goes like this. Oh, we long to be forgiven by the Aborigine for the crimes that we have committed and the things that we have done. But we'll never know forgiveness and be reconciled as one till the white man says he's sorry and the black man forgives from his heart. Ronnie went on to tell me how the Southern Cross was sacred to his tribal past and how it guided the old bushmen through the night and brought them back to camp. He said the biblical cross was central to our understanding of the nature of forgiveness and could bring healing to our land. The Aboriginal pastor that I mentioned earlier said that in her view the real problems facing her people were issues of culture. Ronnie's view was similar. Christianity by definition confronts culture. In fact, all culture, black or white. And Ronnie was not afraid to call out behaviours within his own cultural demographic that were in conflict with biblical truth. And I suggest that it's not the colour of our skin that defines us, but the colour of our heart that is the real issue here. Reparation is not forgiveness. Voice and treaty are ill-devised solutions. It's probable that lasting reconciliation can only occur when we see sovereignty from a different perspective and find ourselves at the foot of the cross where we acknowledge historical wrongs and extend mutual, unconditional forgiveness to each other. Now, I know my arguments can't be legislated here, but I suggest that they could form part of the discussion on how we as a nation can move forward together in a different way. And I would hope that our religious leaders could take a lead in this discussion. Let me know what you think. I trust you found this opinion piece helpful and I'll catch up with you another time. Remember, the things that appear are not always as they seem. Bye.